the morning of February 12th on the left bank of the Mississippi, not uh, the Seine, and uh, here we are at the new artist quarter. It is great to uh, touch base and meet you, Harry Sweets Edison, in person, having heard you through the years. And I, I think, you know, you've covered these decades where, you know, it was vaudeville and radio and uh, recordings that ran at 78 revolutions per minute. Here it is, it's 1996, and all of the new technology is setting in, and I just uh, want to touch on one early part of your career that not m many of us know about. Uh, the bands you played with, like Jeter Pillars, for example. Well, that was the band I left Columbus, Ohio with, the Jeter Pillars band. And uh, we uh, went to Cleveland, Ohio. I got stranded there, and... Uh, then I went to St. Louis and spent quite some time there. And then, uh, then I went to New York. But at St. Louis, I met uh, Joe Jones and uh, Walter Page. We were playing with the Jeter Pillars Band. And when Benny Moten died, they uh, went to Kansas City and uh, joined the uh, Basie Band. And uh, Sidney Catlett and Jimmy Blanton replace those two fellows. So I've been in some good company. Indeed, good company. And when you mentioned Jimmy Blanton, who helped to advance the character and the style of the bass, we're in St. Paul, Minneapolis, where his uh, next ambassador and legacy, Oscar Pettiford. Right, that's for sure, that's for sure. And uh, both of them had Indian heritage, so uh, and both of them were absolutely the epitome of their instrument. They were just, in fact, uh, Jimmy Blanton started the uh, solos on the bass, so far as I'm concerned, because when he made that Jack the Bear with Duke Ellington, that turned the bass playing all around from what it used to be. And uh, he, was, he was quite a guy, Jimmy Blanton, and uh, he passed away at an early, early age. I think he was only about 24, 25 when he passed away in New York. And uh, he was a handsome guy, and all the ladies loved him, loved him madly. So uh, then after I joined the Count Basie band, that was, uh, had it not been for Count Basie, I wouldn't be here giving you an interview because he gave me a chance. And, uh, uh, it was just such a pleasure to play with that band. I joined the band in 38, and uh, we had three trumpets, Buck Clayton, Ed Lewis, and myself. We had two trombones, Dickie Wells, Dan Minor, and uh, there was uh, Earl Warren, first saxophone, Jack Washington played alto and baritone, and Lester Young and Herschel Evans, and of course, Freddie Green and the All-American Rhythm Section. So I don't think I could have been with anybody any better. In fact, I know I couldn't be with any. Couldn't have been with any any band that that created as much excitement in the jazz world as Count Basie. He had uh, the greatest band in the world. It was the greatest band in the world to me. And uh, of course, you had the Ellington, the Chick Webb, and the Jimmy Lonsford, But we had a swinging band. I can remember s asking Snooky Young, who at a very young age joined Jimmy Lunsford's band, I think at the Howard Theater in Washington, and he said he, the first, you know, day or so on the band, uh, or just before the band, he, he sat out in front and watched the band, and he said he became deathly ill. How about your first day on the Basie band in the, the hours preceding? Well, uh... I was uncomfortable because uh, we didn't have any music. Everything was head arrangements. And uh, of course, they had been playing that same music that they played with uh, Benny Moten's band. And uh, uh, when they would start something, I wouldn't know when to come in because he noodled around on the piano until he got the right tempo and everybody knew when to come in. So consequently, I was lost. And uh, no one could tell you because they, uh, they didn't know uh, most of the time when to come in, but uh, they were on time when they came in. 
and uh, I sort of got depressed and uh, put my, put my notice in. And I, and, uh, I told Basie, I said, well, man, uh, I can't, uh, I don't know anything. You don't have any music. I couldn't read that good, but in fact, nobody in the band could read that good. But uh, they did have some, uh, they were together. And I told him I'd like to quit. So he said, well, you sound good. What's the matter? I said, well, every time you play a tune like a uh, one o'clock jump or out the window or something like that, everybody has a note to hit. I can't find a note to play. He said, well, find a note tonight. And if it sounds good, play the same damn note every night. So that's what I did. <laughs> Uh, I stayed with the band from 1938 until 1950, and I joined the band two or three more times. Uh, well, that was like home to me. Whenever he needed a trumpet player, uh, I would always, whatever I was doing, I would go and stay for, you know, until I had to go back to the studios in Los Angeles, California. But that's the way, that was my home, the Count Basie Band. And... Uh, he uh, said, well, if you find a note and it, uh, you put it in the right place tonight, just play the same damn note every night, you know. So that was, that was, uh, that tightened me with him because that made me realize that he was a man that had patience. And uh, he had a lot of character. No one ever quit the band and he never fired anybody. We all knew that we had to, uh, uh, be there at a certain time, so we were, and uh, we were all brothers in the band because we more familiar with each other than we were our wives because we played like 251 nighters a year. There was no place at that time like uh, that black bands could play because you couldn't play on the radio, the staff bands, that you couldn't play in the, and go to Hollywood and be on a staff band there or nothing. The only thing we could play in the hotels, they only hired like uh, Benny Goodman and Glenn Miller and uh, Harry James and uh, Jimmy Dorsey and Tommy Dorsey. So we had to do mostly one-nighters all the year. And uh, consequently, we became just very, very close, you know. But it was, uh, it was a great band and uh, Lester Young gave me the name Sweets when I first joined the band. And uh, uh, Billy Holiday was, uh, had just joined the band. Uh, I got to, that was my f audition with her, first meeting her. And then after that, we became very close friends and I made many, many, many records with Billy Holiday. Just many records. And she was my favorite singer my favorite singer, Lady Day. Lady Day certainly had a had an approach that was the signature for all vocal music. Uh, how would you describe it? Well, she had a sound. She had a sound that was, uh, you always know it's Billie Holiday when you hear her on a record because she's the only one that had that sound and had that style that she, that she would always sing. You knew it was her when she opened her mouth on the record. I'd say, that's Billy, that's Lady Day. So uh, that was one unique, unique thing about her. She, uh, and she was so pleasant, you know. She was easy to record with. But, uh, you know, in those days, everybody was, had a sound that could be identified by, you know. Uh, as I said before, we all strive to have a sound in those days that you could be identified by. Like Lester had a sound. You know it's Lester when he plays on a record. Coleman Hawkins had a sound. Of course, my idol, Louis Armstrong, had a sound. Uh, ben Webster had a sound. Uh, Zoot Sams had a sound of his own, but he was a Lester Young disciple. But he did have a sound of his own. And in those days, uh, Chew Berry had a sound of his own. Uh, the, everybody strived to be original. They strived to be an individualist. And they used to say they would uh, rather be the world's worst originator than to be the world's greatest imitator. And that's the way that they felt.
you know, they wanted to sound like themselves, like, like not like nobody else. Because when I first met Dizzy, he used to sound just like Roy Eldridge. That was, he was a Roy Eldridge disciple. But going jamming every morning in New York, when we get off from work at four o'clock, we'd go to a joint and play all night, you know. And he finally found the way that he wanted to play, which was different. And that's what made Dizzy Gillespie uh, a stylist and an originator. He played something different than anybody else. So uh, those were the days where everybody had a sound that was their own. And you could tell them on a record, you didn't have to guess who it was. They weren't imitators, they were originators. Your signature, how did it evolve? Well, I didn't know I had one. <laughs> I don't know. I just try to uh, play the way that I feel, and uh, uh, I'm blessed by being able to uh, still play. God has been good to me, still is, because I appeared here this weekend, and I uh, felt like playing. I feel good, and uh, when you're blessed, uh, you have so many things to be grateful for, you know, and uh, uh, I'm going to keep on playing as long as God gives me health and strength to play, and I love to play, and I've had a great weekend here, just absolutely fabulous. Uh, I didn't know that I was that popular, but uh, the people have been wonderful, and it was uh, such a surprise to see so many youngsters come out and uh, enjoy uh, one of the oldest art forms in America, uh, which is jazz. And uh, I have really had a fabulous three days here in the artist quarters. And with you here, it made the whole weekend complete. And I hope to come back again. And I hope I'll see you again when I get back. Harry Sweets Edison on this Oh, morning of Monday, uh, the 12th of February in the year 1996. It is a privilege to sit in and talk with you and uh, look at history and look at integrity and the professional life you lead. And just keep good health. And so good to see you. It's good to be here, and I, uh, if God's willing, I'll be back. Looking forward to it.